in, we'll just remind them that they are being live streamed and the video will be publicly available. And just everyone remember to speak into your microphones and one at a time, please, and turn your mobile phones off or onto silent. So, um, so who would like to start us with a karakia, Shed? Uh, morena tātou. Uh, tātou ko hui tāki nei tēnei ata, tēnā koutou. Uh, kia koutou rā i ngā e ngā manuhiri, uh, i whakapako to hea rā uh, i o whakaaro uh, ki Wanginui a tātou i nei āwhitanga nō ia. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Kia koe rā Anne, i whakahare nei tēnei ata tātou nei hui. Tēnā koutou. Nō reira, me tīmata mo ki tātou me tēte um, karakia, kia pahare tēnei ata tātou nei hui. Nō reira, kia nei tātou. I te atua anei mātou o Pongi na tēnei kia koe tēnei rā, i ka tūki ngā tapa mai me tēnei whakawhiu tāi kia koe, nā i mena ki tanga katoa, nā mena ki tia rā tātou katoa, tātou i atu piripiri hea nei i ngā take, i ngā hotangi pāne ki tēnei kaupapa, kia whai hua rā e tātou katoa, i ngai te tika, te pono me te aroha, tēnei mā tēnei tēnei kia koe, glory to ngā take. Amen. Okay, uh, so now we have some <coughs> apologies this morning. We've got Wayne, depending on his health, he might zoom in. Um, Wayne Bilby, so he, but he is an apology. Bruce Robertson's an apology, and Tapio Kawe is an apology. And then uh, Commissioner Selwood is uh, an apology for the first hour. He will be joining us. He's just at another meeting. Um, speaking at another meeting. Uh, but any, uh, anyone who then wants to take part in the deliberations will have to go back and view the video um, submission of, of the submission. So in other words, you can't take part in the decision making if you haven't heard all the submissions. Fortunately, we, we um, record all the submissions and so they're available for any of the, of the members who's apologising today to, to catch up with if they want to be part of the deliberations. And certainly um, Commissioner Selwood will be joining us uh, later on this morning. Uh, so can I have a mover and seconder to accept the apologies, Bill and Shed, thank you very much. Uh, all, I'll put that, all those in favour say aye. Against carried. We have no public forum today because it is actually a, a hearings instead. Um, we have no late items and there's no confidential business to be transferred into the open. Uh, there's no change to the order of business, although there may be changes to the order of submittance. We'll take them as they come. Uh, any uh, declarations of conflict to declare? None, thank you. That brings us to the business for today, which is the uh, submissions on the revised draft local alcohol policy. And the first person we have joining us today is Michael Mills from Ngātorangi Iwi Trust. Good morning, Michael. So the floor is yours. Yep, make sure you're on. And um, uh, I, I, five minutes or ten minutes? Five minutes. And then, and then we might have some questions. Thank you. Mm. Inga rangatira wahine, me inga tānei, tēnā koutou. Called Michael Mills Aho. Um, I'm an advisor to Turunanga or Naitaranga Iwi Trust uh, for the KED program, which is a community action on youth and alcohol and drugs. And in this role, I support the Runanga through uh, the preparation of policies, submissions, written objections uh, to alcohol related issues, both locally and nationally. Um, from 2006 to 2015, I was the first uh, coordinator for Tauranga Safe City and was actively involved in the establishment and operation of the Strand Night Management Plan and the establishment and operation of the Off-Licence Alcohol Accord, which, were the, which was the first of its kind in the country. Uh, I did that work alongside uh, Sergeant Nigel McGlone, who was the liquor licensing uh, former sergeant. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it's great to re-establish the connections with Nigel uh, in this space. Um, but I understand both of those initiatives have lapsed and I strongly advocate for their reinstatement because they're based on relationships. Now the, the times are changing and the tide has finally turned, I believe, with respect to the management of the sale and supply of alcohol in our community. 
The Court of Appeal gave a resounding endorsement of the Auckland LAP, and the government has now signalled it's going to move on legislation around uh, leg uh, liquor, liquor now, and, um, and moving with some speed. So on that basis, uh, we support the recommendation that you defer your deliberations on this LAP until after that legislation is enacted, because it most likely will have a direct impact on, uh, on, on the things you can do. Um, by removing the right of appeal, and with it the threat of lengthy and expensive litigation, you'll have a clear field of view to assess and accept the evidence that has been presented, and you'll be able to adopt the rules and controls that are now before you. In December 2021, uh, we made several non-regulatory requests. Um, we asked for a seat for Iwi Māori at the District Licensing Committee, and those conversations are currently underway. Uh, we asked uh, for the District Licensing Committee hearings process to be more amenable to community and cultural sensitivities, including things like the date, time and location of hearings, and observing appropriate cultural protocols. This is still on the table. Uh, and we asked for an active notification process for liquor licensing activities. And this has definitely improved, but there's still uh, more that needs to be done to ensure the communities are actively engaged. <coughs> we supported the 2 a.m. closing for the CBD bars, and we still endorse the police on this. But as I noted earlier, uh, the reinstatement of the Strand Night Management Accord would go further to mitigate real and potential harm than just enforcing an earlier closing time. We supported the separation and elaboration of conditions for club licenses. Um, bars have patrons, clubs have members, off licenses have customers. They are different transactional environments and should be dealt with accordingly. Uh, we endorse the containment of entertainment precincts, including prohibiting new licenses in industrial areas, and we're pleased to see that that's included now. Um, we advocated that the LAP and the gambling venues policies, that they need to be aligned because they're intertwined. And th that's probably still some work that needs to be done. In December 2021, I, we were very unhappy with the uh, proposed lack of controls on off licenses. <coughs> we advocated for controls on location, density, and hours of operation. And we acknowledge the work that's now been done by staff to now offer a suite of controls for off licenses that pretty much align with our recommendations. In particular, uh, the hours of operation, we support the 10 a.m. Uh, opening. We strongly support the restriction on new off licenses in high decile communities. And we support the introduction of compulsory and discretionary conditions relating to things like single sale, signage, CCTV, lighting, incident registers, and so on. It's good. It's all good stuff. By providing the District Licensing Committee with a toolkit of interventions, it means that every hearing no longer has to relitigate the legislation from first principles. At present, communities are confounded, and the liquor industry and their lawyers are prevailing due to a lack of direction in the local alcohol policy. As I said at the start, the times are changing. The intent of the Act was to enable and empower communities to have a voice and to make choices about the sale and supply of alcohol. Fundamental flaws in the legislation and overwhelming power of the liquor industry have conspired to make it all but impossible for communities and councils to recognise and give effect to those voices and choices until now. No reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you very much, Michael. Oh, sorry. Um, does, are there any questions for Michael? No, you're a bit lucky. Oh, just, can you just, uh, we're yeah. just getting feedback. If you just yeah. turn that off. Oh, could I just make one further comment yeah, sure. then? Um, because I thought there might be some questions. Um, just with respect to the uh, uh, restriction for off licenses in the high decile communities, um, rather than, if, if there's uh, some objection around the table to that, I think plan B around that could be uh, what we've recommended in our first submission around a rebuttable presumption, which says there's going to be no new licenses unless you can make a really strong case. 
to say that you can address the real issue, issues of harm. I'm thinking, say, someone who opens a florist shop and wants to do a gift basket with a bottle of wine and wants to open it in Yatton Park, well, they couldn't. But if they could make a case, you know. So I just think there may be some discretion there. But look, a blanket prohibition suits us just fine. I did have a question. I'm quite interested in the uh, uh, Strand Night Management Accord, because this is going to be, um, we, 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 we sort of got a bit of a dilemma in that we're trying to create a vibrant city centre, but at the same time you want to, you, you want to have good behaviour. Um, so you want a place where people do want to come and mix and mingle and be entertained and um, but you don't want you don't want fights and you don't want um, assaults and all the, all the things that you know the police have made us aware of. So so how did that accord work? Well, when I uh, arrived in Tauranga and, and took up the role in two thousand and six, um, every Monday paper was the Strand was a war zone, and uh, there was all manner of problems down there, both with the uh, environmental design, with the behaviour of patrons, with indeed the behaviour of bars. Uh, it was a bit of a nightmare. Uh, and so the council moved to bring all the parties together. But it, it turned out, you know, we had the licensees in that corner, the licensing inspectors in that corner, the police in that corner, community in this corner, and they all just came out swinging. I mean, that was the bigger war zone in many ways. Uh, and it was actually breaking down the barriers to communication amongst the, those parties that was the absolute key to seeing some demonstrable change. And uh, that included the realignment of the footpath so that it didn't go through the middle of the, the bars. Uh, uh, changes to lighting, changes to the way uh, the training that was offered to bar staff and door staff around uh, safety. Um, uh, Money was spent uh, miking up the um, the door staff and getting away from this notion of bouncer to actually saying, well, you're front of house, you know, you're the host. Uh, getting just changing perspectives and perceptions, and and uh, over a period of time, we almost got to the stage, I think, where we felt that uh, we'd achieved what 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 was intended in that plan, but it was based on breaking down the barriers, breaking down the the, yeah, yes, yes, and getting people talking. And I think um, uh, Nigel will certainly have his own perspective on that because he's very much a party to it at the time as well. I think it would lend enormous strength to uh, to achieve the things that you, you're aspiring to. Thank you for that. Um, so the other question I had for you is the most contentious, and in fact I think it's the first time the committee's ever had a vote, uh, was whether to put the controls on the off licences or not. Um, so that's quite a contentious issue, and, and obviously we've got a lot of submitters today who are affected by that. Um, and some of them are saying, well, there's no evidence that that's going to make any difference. Uh, you know, and, and we would be happy to talk about ours if there was evidence that could be presented. What, do you, what are your comments on that? Yes, well, this is the very thing that's, that's happened, is that the weight has gone on to the community, to health, police and so on, to produce evidence of harm. It needs to be completely flipped over to the industry to turn around and say, how are they going to prevent harm? The, the, the issue of evidence, the, 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 the Court of Appeal looked at that, and, they, and the Court of Appeal said, your decisions in your local alcohol policy don't have to just be solely evidence-based because if the, well, the weight of the community says we want these controls, that's a good enough reason. And the second thing they said was, even if you're not 100% sure or evidence-based, you have a right to trial it and to test it and to see if it's going to make a difference. So in other words, I think there's far more le leeway there than a sort of, and this is where I think the legal side of it gets kind of caught up. Well, you haven't got evidence, you know, you, 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 and start trying to put tight boundaries around decisions when, in fact, I think the Court of Appeal really said, you know, you have some freedom to, to actually try this stuff, to actually put it in place and see if it's making a difference and monitor the performance. 
uh, rather than feeling like you have to justify every single little decision along the way because that that's exactly the box they want to put us in when it comes to try and introduce control. Uh, so I think the Court of Appeal decision in particular supports a much more expansive approach to controls, particularly around off-licences. Thank you very much. That's helpful. Rauhario. Um, morena. Sorry, and just one question. Um, uh, ko te mea toa tahi me mihi kātika ki a koe e shed me tō karakia i whakawātea ai tō tātou nei hui. Tēnā koe a o te rā ki a koe hoki e Michael. Um, thank you very much for your submission today. I just had one question because you are, I think, the only um, iwi who is um, pro providing or, you know, representative of an iwi who is providing a submission, an oral submission today. And my thoughts really are around whether you have any comment or whether the runanga has any whakaro around the point around no new bottle stores to be established in areas. And I'm thinking of areas such as Marae and Papakainga. Um, Papakainga are being uh, redeveloped now. And what um, what whakaro iwi might have in terms of their, their areas where majority of their people are living or will be living in the future. Yes, I think that, I mean, that's, that is a valid question, but I think from the Runanga's point of view, it, 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 there's been a feeling that because there's been absolutely no controls over where bottle shops can, can come, uh, it's been frustrating to, to be able to even have a voice on it. And even when you do have a voice on it, um, it can quite often simply be overruled. So I think that's a discussion that, that would need to happen. But So I can't, I'm not really qualified to speak for that. But I think it's a, it, we need to have that conversation. And it needs to be at the front end rather than at the back end. One of the frustrations that we do have is that, uh, uh, you know, we always feel like we're objecting to things. <laughs> you know, we always feel like we're saying no to things, you know. <laughs> Oh, no more, please, you know, stop. Uh, whereas if we're at the front end of some of these decisions and some of these these processes, uh, a lot of that could be mitigated, I think, uh, going forward. Thanks, Michael. Um, just the discussion's kind of prompted a question from me. Um, just in terms of the night, uh, the Australian Night Management Accord, um, I assume from the conversation that it's currently no longer operating. Not? Okay. okay. I mean, it might be a question that, we, you know, during deliberations we can have a conversation about, but yeah. I think I'll park that question because it's, it's, it's probably a question for later. I suppose I just want to understand if it's not going, why is it not continuing to operate? I mean, that's for another conversation, but I thought you might know, but you don't have to answer it. I'll go on. All I was going to say was, that as far as I know, it is not uh, uh, currently working as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as an entity. I think um, in some of the conversations that have been had with some of the um, operators uh, uh, through the previous hearing, there's a desire, if they, they didn't give it that label, but they certainly expressed a desire to have those sorts of conversations with that wide, wider group of, of people on a regular basis to help with some of the management. So, um, But the staff might have been listening. I'm sure they will get us some information on, on it. Um, so no, no further questions. Look, thank you very much. I, 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 d I did open it up and give you a bit longer because... Um, because for one, you are the only iwi that's making representations, but actually you made, the iwi made a really good um, presentation at the first round of hearings, which resulted in the, the, the new draft, and, um, and so it was a good opportunity to, to tease some of that out. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so Rob McGregor is not with us from Papamal Pack, Pack and Save. Do we have Mark Fogarty? Here, I see him sitting over the back there. Welcome, Mark. Come on up. 
Just make sure you turn on your microphone. Well, no, it's just for ta for, for taping, because we because we yeah we, we, we the live stream Testing. we need to hear you and we need to, to record. Okay, so my name's Mark Fogarty. Um, you probably won't know me. Um, I came back from Australia. Things work in Australia because they've done this. You want to take a good look at that, because why reinvent the wheel when something already works? I had, did a bit of a quick research last night. There's a system called ScanTech. Um, all clubs, cub, uh, sorry, all clubs, pubs, venues, etc., must have an ID scanner. And what, how that works is quite simple. Simply, um, a friend here mentioned that we move from the bouncers to the customer service side of things. Um, bouncers aren't there to be punching bags, uh, either the police. Um, simply put, you have to provide a legitimate ID to get into a venue. Um, if you don't provide that legitimate ID, you don't get in. Um, now, should you attend that venue and cause any trouble, you get ejected. The, um, the brilliance of the system is then those folks simply send that information to all the other venues. So you are now out of the district. You can't go anywhere else. You're soon next in the next state because if you misbehave, you're gone. It's that big stick, you're gone. And um, it works, it works very well. Um, I don't know if any of you are over um, King's Cross, what happened there. It used to be the night district, fighting, violence, drugs, stabbings, killing, shootings, just that was every day. Um, they um, went, went about the same sort of approach. It became somewhere that families could go dine any time, day or night. You'd never do that before unless you were a silly Kiwi like myself. Um, but um, um, so these things work. So why look elsewhere? Why waste time with all this consultation when there's something that already works that you could go and get that information? Well, I'm sure that um, the uh, authorities overseas would be more than happy to help you um, and consultate, show you exactly how these systems work. You'll get all the bleating about you know rights and all the rest of it, but if you um, would like to go to a venue for a legitimate reason, like to take your family to dinner, to go out for a drink, whatever the, the uh, reason might be, um, you're more than welcome, um, as long as you behave. Um, should you not decide not to behave, then you become um, someone that's on a list, and you just don't get off that list. And um, it really, really works. Now, from the front end of things, um, I stayed at the Wonderlust in the Strand, and um, I saw firsthand what everyone's asleep, what goes on. So um, I'm going to name a couple of the bars. Uh, the Cornerstone, for instance, um, that used to spew out um, all the drunks, probably about two, three o'clock in the morning, every morning. Um, that's your um, right in the heart of your eatery district for first thing in the morning on the weekends, and um, they were um, they were drunk. They were completely hammered. They were fighting. Um, the police, obviously fairly busy, sent a couple of token officers down just to wait it out until they could get more members down there to look after things. Uh, those folks were throwing bottles, uh, vandalising, smashing the hoardings. Um, and this is all the time, it's not one off, okay? Um, and um, so um, I took it upon myself to clean it up, and, and I did exactly that. Because I started off getting up in the morning, opening the doors at the Wonderlust, helping the staff. We walk out at six o'clock in the morning, and from the front door of the Wonderlust, right out and onto the street was just glass. You could not walk on that glass. Um, we had um, other examples of, uh, we had some Russian guys try to light the Wonderlust on fire one night. So they'd been through the city, they'd been further up at, um, I'm just trying to think, the Pop-Up Park below um, Bapland Regional Council. That's now um, just been dismantled. They were parking up there. Um, I happened to just ride back through in the middle of the night and see them there, said hello, as I do to uh, all the folks on the street. They were definitely not friendly folks. I knew that they were going to be trouble. Sure enough, um, Probably two hours later, they turned up 
uh, in the Wanderlust, they walked in the door, tried to nick some stuff, we ejected them. Um, and then a couple of hours later, they started smashing the streets up. Um, they were basically demolishing all the hoardings. They were knocking down all the traffic control measures um, out on um, Devonport Road, um, where all the construction is going on. Um, across the road, um, they were vandalising everything here in McCleary Park, and, um, and away they went. Uh, the police actually turned up in the middle of the night. Um, we sort of crashed out at sort of three o'clock. We thought they'd parked up. We'd seen them parked up. Thought they'd done. But they came back and tried to light the building on fire. Um, the police attended that, and uh, luckily it never got going because there would, would have been 50 people in that building. So they actually physically tried to light it on fire. We were just lucky it was a concrete building and um, they didn't have enough fuel. Um, let's see. Okay, moving across the road. Um, over at here in McCurry Park, I just started taking it on myself to clean up all the bottles and glass that were coming directly from Cornerstone, from those people. Um, first it was glass across you know, the lovely walking area. Then it was here in McCurry Park. And found myself there pretty much Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, cleaning up the glass. And it went all the way up around um, Bay of Plenty Regional Council headquarters, right through to Memorial Park. Um, when I got to was it Yatton Park, the next one along, that one's actually pretty tidy. People look after that one. But pretty much all the way through there, it was just a pigsty. Um, sure, there were some homeless folks, and that's fine. Most of them are just unfortunate, um, you know, down on their luck. They looked after the place, they made it their home, um, but there was um, a strong gang element, um, how gangs are selling drugs in here in McCurry Park until I asked them to leave, um, country style. Um, and, um, and they did. And um, so, you know, it's not the police's job to do this. It's, it's the community's job. And we have the tools um, to do that and um, nice talk doesn't work on people that don't listen and have never been around nice talk. You need a big stick approach. And um, so again, um, systems like ScanTech really work. It would help the community. Um, I ran for the Bowfinger Regional Council um, and I cleaned up while I was doing that. And I was over at um, the Mount even, riding my bike and talking to the publicans over there and talking about these systems and they were all in favour. They were just saying, bring it, how do we get this stuff here? Because we don't want this either. Um, I used to work in the security industry, so um, nobody, again, goes to work to get shot, stabbed or beaten up. I can assure you of that. Um, and um, same with our friends in the police, same with any other service workers, uh, the hospitals, whatever. Um, we need to curb this bad behaviour and the only way to do it is um, sensible thinking. Um, just go back to old-fashioned um, values, really. Um, and again, I know it sounds bad, but if you push people out of one district into another, then you educate them, those folks, how to do the same, they soon end up in the middle of nowhere. And um, they won't be very happy about it. Um, they'll tend to change their behaviour because they'll want to come back to um, society at some stage. Um, this also worked in the shopping centres, the major shopping centres. So we used to ban people from shopping centres. So um, people that didn't care didn't used to really think that really mattered until they found that they couldn't go to the next shopping centre or the one after that or the one after that, the next suburb, the next state. All of a sudden, it makes a big difference. Um, and it's all about recording information um, and... Um, and um, they're just asking people to behave themselves. Now, how does that, all that help, uh, like our friend said here? Um, people, when they feel safe, they come back into the cities. They bring their families. Um, I can tell you from a fact that the body language on people on the street in the Strand in the evenings or even in the daytime was defensive. Okay? Uh, women with their daughters, I presume, were walking, and you know, when you walk past them, they went to a defensive position. It's body language. And that's because they are afraid. So that doesn't really say much for this wonderful city, does it? That 
people are afraid to walk on the street in the daytime. So I think it's time we should take our streets back. And it all starts with us um, actually caring a little. Um, what I did find when I did the clean-up is people asked me if I worked for the council because I wore a particular uniform. And I said, no, I just do this because I, um, I'm really upset about what's happened to our community while I've been overseas. It's really pissed me off, in fact. And, um, and I found that people actually started coming out and helping. So they came out of their homes. They started getting their community back. They came out and sat in the parks after I cleaned up and pushed the undesirables out. Um, and that basically just shows you that that's all that we need, a bit of security. Um, people at the base level need to feel safe. And of course that leads on to your public transport and everything else, but people need to get into the city, get out, feel safe. And if they do so, um, you'll have a vibrant um, community in the city. You'll have people spending money. Um, you don't need all those people piling into bars, getting off their faces and uh, causing destruction, graffiti, vandalising all the signs, all the things that we all have to pay for. Um, I'm not sure of the legislation here, but of course in Australia there's a responsible service of alcohol. You cannot serve anybody that you believe is intoxicated. Now you can't tell me at all that any or most uh, Phoenix is one person I've talked to that actually does care a bit about that sort of stuff, but you can't tell me that you could go to any of those venues uh, late at night and not find people completely intoxicated and still being served by the bars. Um, thank, thank you, Mark. I'm going to have to stop. Thank you, you very much for your time. But thank you, and thank you for um, going and cleaning up on a, on, a, on, on a regular basis. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mickey, have we got Mickey Jackson? She's online. All oh, right, sorry. <laughs> Kia ora. There she is. Thank you. So, so welcome. Um, we can we can all see you, and you've got um, you know about five minutes to talk to us, and we may have some questions. And you can hear me okay. We can. Yes, perfect. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Um, apologies, I can't be there in person. Look, it's, it's clear from the data that there's a high level of alcohol harm in your region, especially to males and particularly from the impacts of chronic drinking, but also from intoxication. And we know that there will be inequities in drinking and harm that will be particularly carried by Māori Pacifica in low-income communities. And this will be having huge social, physical and mental health and economic consequences that are borne by every resident in your region. So you have been given the opportunity through local alcohol policies uh, to protect your residents from those vast harms. So, you know, I talked about what Michael was saying earlier. You know, we put out a uh, media release uh, end of last year uh, calling for greater action in the last draft local alcohol policy for greater protections from off license supply, together with the GP from Mount Monganui. So I'm really glad to see the proposed changes to New Zealand's key source of alcohol supply being off licenses, which we know is, is readily available and, um, and alcohol products are sold very, very cheap. So the early closing hours are important uh, to reduce harm, particularly to our young heavy drinkers. So we do not support the 10 p.m. closing, we would prefer 9 p.m. But we do strongly support the opening hour of 10 a.m. This will particularly protect children, young people, and persons with alcohol use disorders. I'm really overwhelmed by the number of submissions you have got on this draft policy. Uh, oh, we, support no, <laughs> we support no new bottle stores opening in suburbs for the deprivation decile of seven or higher. Um, I do note that if you're going to use um, statistical area units to define suburbs, that they, those boundaries don't really overlap with the way that communities carry out their day-to-day -day lives. So we would want to see high depth communities you know, surrounding a, a premises offered those protections from no additional outlets. We would like to see some measures put in place regarding protecting sensitive sites um, and their users from any new off-license opening in close proximity. 
I, I looked at the data and 27 councils of the 41 councils that have an adopted local alcohol policy have a provision in place in their LAP to protect those that use sensitive sites, whether it's a, a distance threshold or that the DLC needs to take the issue into account or that the applicant has to show evidence that they've consulted with neighbouring sensitive sites in their application. We support the off-licence discretionary conditions but recommend some others. Um, you may see in the Waikato provisional local alcohol policy at the moment a discretionary condition around buy now, pay later. Uh, we would like strong protections put in place around off-licence alcohol advertising. And just last month, we're really welcoming, Auckland District Licensing Committee have now issued a practice note for all new off-licences and renewal off-licence applications will not be able to have any alcohol advertising of alcohol products on their exteriors. And unless there's good reason um, not to, so that, that's that's a huge step that's been taken to really uh, impact, you know, reduce the impact of alcohol advertising outside bottle stores. For the on-license proposals, we support no new on-licenses in area zone industrial, for the same reasons that Michael was saying. Uh, we don't support the 3 a.m. closing of on-licenses in the city centre. Uh, our submission clearly shows that as you get later uh, closing towards after uh, midnight that the risk of harm increases substantially. For clubs, we don't support the closing hours of 1am and 2am in the city centre. We recommend 12am across the board. And for special licences, we really want to uh, encourage you to follow the leadership of the Wairo uh, Local Alcohol Policy, uh, which says that special licences won't be granted for child-focused events. So thank you for, for going to you know, look at this LAP again, putting in strong measures around off-license supply, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Jackson. So, have we got, has anyone got any questions for her? Yeah, Bill. Um, thank you, Dr. Jackson. Um, you, the submission makes comments, and you picked it up in your verbal presentation. Um, in terms of um, suburbs being clearly um, clearly defined, so a license is unable to be granted if it if it borders presumably um, an area that is within that um, defined deprivation index. I'd just be interested in terms of what your thinking is in terms of how what would the nature of any restriction be? Because that's going beyond in terms of what we've suggested in the LAP in terms of those areas um, referencing the deprivation index. Yes, but, but it, it isn't indicated whether that's at a kind of a mesh block level or whether that's at a higher level of a census, um, what we used to call a census area unit, now statistical area. Um, or whether you're going to kind of do what Auckland does and draw boundaries around suburbs and say no new off licenses within these areas. I, I just know from doing applications or objections to off licenses, so often um, commercial areas are, are directly on, on a border of one other area unit. So we know the harm from alcohol extends um, from off licenses, you know, up to two to three kilometres. So, so we want to make sure that if there are high depth areas that are in close proximity, that they are still protected as well. So it's, it's up to you how you, you know, deliberate on how you draw um, your suburbs. It may be that you go for a, um, more of a geographical basis and that those suburbs encapsulate areas that experience high deprivation. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, Okay, Alan Fisher from uh, Cancer Society. Welcome. Yeah, can you hear me okay? We can, and so you've got about five minutes and maybe some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Commissioners. Kia ora, my name's Alan Fisher. I work for the Waikato Bay of Plenty Cancer Society. Thanks so much for this opportunity to make an oral submission on the revised draft local alcohol policy. Research tells us that drinking alcohol increases the risk of seven cancers. In no particular order, these are cancer of the mouth, pharynx, larynx, esophagus, breast in women, bowel and liver. And the risk is dose related. That is, the more alcohol you drink, 
the greater the risk of developing cancer. To be honest, in terms of cancer risk, there is no safe level of alcohol consumption. Few of us are aware of the cancer risk related to drinking alcohol, but in reality, alcohol is the same class of carcinogen as tobacco and asbestos. And many of us will have experienced firsthand the devastating impact of a cancer diagnosis in our whānau and amongst our friends. In 2019, it was estimated that alcohol caused about 6% of all cancer deaths. That's over 640 people. Māori experienced a higher burden of alcohol-related cancers. In 2012, Māori lost an average of 12.7 years of life from alcohol-attributable cancers compared with just over 10 years for non-Māori. That is why the Cancer Society supports and applauds local alcohol policy that reduces supply of alcohol into a community, reduces demand for alcohol, and stops the marketing of alcohol, particularly to rangatahi. And we know that prevention measures focused on populations and environmental influences on health have a larger impact, greater potential for equity, and tend to be more cost effective than interventions focused on particularly high risk individuals. So let's make the healthier choice, that is to drink less or no alcohol, the easiest choice in Tauranga. For these reasons, the Cancer Society supports the proposed policy changes to change the sales time for off licenses from 7 to 10 a.m to not allow any more off licenses in areas of high deprivation or zones, areas zoned as industrial, as well as the range of discretionary conditions for off license premises. We would also suggest that having no off license premises within 100 metres of schools, early childhood centres, playgrounds, parks, reserves, marae, health facilities, and AOD treatment centres. Let's not normalise alcohol consumption and the harm it causes to vulnerable groups in our community, our kids, rangatahi and komatua. As the Cancer Prevention Report notes, a higher number and density of outlets and longer trading hours are linked to higher levels of alcohol consumption and higher rates of hazardous drinking. We cannot support the proposal to retain the current alcohol sales time at 3 a.m., nor the removal of the one-door provision for on-licence premises. There is no value add in these proposals, simply more opportunity to amplify the many harms associated with drinking alcohol. And we know from the New Zealand Health Survey about 20% of us are hazardous drinkers. People who have an established pattern of drinking that carries a high risk of future damage to physical or mental health. Future damage like cancer. Te Aho o Te Kahu, our cancer control agency, reports that 20 to 30% of cancers are preventable worldwide by reducing or removing everyone's exposure to the cancer risk factor present in our lives. Risk factors like alcohol. The Cancer Prevention Report lists reducing the number of density, the number, sorry, and the density of licensed premises and decreasing trading hours as key actions to reduce alcohol related cancers in Aotearoa, New Zealand. In closing, we congratulate this Council on most of the measures proposed in the revo revised draft local alcohol policy as valuable steps to redress the harm caused by alcohol in Tauranga. Harm like cancer. Kia ora. Thank you very much, um, Alan. Uh, have anyone got any questions for her? No? And you've got a very substantial submission. So thank you. Appreciate uh, hearing from you this morning. Kia ora. Kia ora. 
so next we have Ian Thane, is it, and Suk Skorgi from Foodstuffs New Zealand? Yeah, I'm ah, right. Welcome, Ian. Uh, there we are. You're on screen, and so welcome. So you've got about five minutes, and then there may be some questions for you. Tēnā koutou, ko Ian Thane ho more foodstuffs to Ika Amali. My name's Ian Thane. I'm a partner at DLA Piper, and thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of Foodstuffs North Island's submission on your proposed uh, new local alcohol policy. There are two aspects of it that I can speak on uh, this morning in the time available. Firstly, the issue of the proposal to change the morning hour for off-license sales from 7am to 10am, and secondly, some issues about a couple of the proposed discretionary conditions for off-license sales. In relation to hours, the starting point for thinking about that is, of course, your own principles as set out in the draft local alcohol policy, those principles including to make Tauranga an inclusive city, or at least keep it that way, and to reflect local communities' character, amenity, values, preferences and needs, and to encourage and foster positive and responsible drinking behaviour. Those are appropriate principles um, Foodstuffs considers, and they are the principles against which the policy should be tested and uh, checked. The local alcohol policy, of course, sets only maximum trading hours in any given situation for any given premises or business, of course, more restrictive hours are available and the District Licensing Committee can impose them. So when setting the maximum trading hours for off-licenses, the City should look at the best uh, premises because these are the most hours that can be available for anybody. People in the city, as they do all over Aotearoa, do have reasons to shop early in the morning and certainly before 10am. Those reasons include working around their work commitments, childcare commitments, and of course, especially in an area like Tauranga, there are times of the year when uh, the town is particularly busy and people look to avoid those busy times. It's a way of allowing supermarkets to effectively increase in size to handle those increases in population that you have around holiday times. People can shop outside of the main hours in order to spread that demand. When people shop in supermarkets and grocery stores, they often wish to include beer or wine in amongst with the rest of their grocery shop. That is a flexibility that people value, and they certainly value it in your community. We know that from the figures that we have. Very few people shopping in foodstuff stores before 10 a.m. buy only alcohol. In fact, it's a very tiny percentage. The vast bulk of alcohol that is sold before 10 a.m. in the morning is sold as part of a much broader grocery shop. There is also the requirement to have flexibility for the future, of course. Tauranga continues to grow, and um, more and more the diversity of the place will mean that people will value the benefits of being able to shop when they need to or choose to. There is a need to strike a balance. Uh, notwithstanding the views that are now held about um, alcohol, the Act, when the Parliament brought it in, was designed to balance what was seen by central government as positive benefits for the community of responsible drinking against the need to minimise alcohol-related harm. And that, of course, that balance still requires uh, consideration when you set your policies. Foodstuffs has not seen any evidence, and there's certainly no evidence available from the material that you have put together in support of this draft policy, any evidence that says that the sale of alcohol before 10 a.m. in the morning from off-licences is leading to increased alcohol-related harm, remembering that the time at which alcohol is purchased from an off-licence is not connected to the time at which alcohol is consumed. In that, off-licences differ dramatically, of course, from on-licences, where the time of sale equals the time of consumption. And the 
uh, comparison must be drawn between what's proposed for off licenses only able to open at 10 a.m. and on licenses, which you're proposing are able to open at 9 a.m. So people will be able to actively consume alcohol from 9 a.m. but not purchase a bottle of wine with their groceries before 10 a.m. Lastly, the only thing that can be taken from other um, alcohol policies around the country, I guess, is that when Auckland proposed a 9 a.m. morning hour that was found by the Alcohol Regulatory and Licensing Authority to be unsupported by the evidence and um, knocked back as being unreasonable in the light of the object of the Act. And that finding of ALA is not the subject of any of the appeals that are happening in relation to the Auckland local alcohol policy. Now, of course, Auckland is a very different place to tow on that, but the principle that evidence needs to be provided to change from um, the national default hours remains. In relation to conditions, there are two that concern foodstuffs. The first is the proposal for discretionary conditions around 440 millilitres being the minimum size for single sales of alcohol with the exception of craft beers. That is concerning because craft beer is a, a potentially ambiguous term. It's difficult, therefore, for conditions like that to be applied with certainty, and licensees ought not to be put in a position where they are not clear and certain on whether they are or are not complying with a condition on their license. Ambiguity should be removed. If the real concern is to prevent licensees breaking down manufacturers' packs, such as a product that's meant to be sold in a six-pack and breaking it down to sell in singles, then any condition should address that specifically, and Foodstuffs would have no problem with such a condition. Foodstuffs does not break down manufacturers' packaging. And the second of the conditions is the proposal to uh, have discretionary conditions related to product type or price or restricting the display of product price or type specials. Firstly, the Act already deals with product type. As you know, foodstuffs and grocery stores are limited to selling only beer, wine and mead and only those products when they are below 15% alcohol. So the government has already set the types that grocery stores can sell. And the government has specifically considered on two occasions bringing in price controls for alcohol, and on both occasions the government has decided not yet to do that. If price controls are to be brought in, it is appropriately done at central government level for competition reasons. Individual stores should not be subject to individual conditions which would restrict what they can sell their products for and therefore create an uncompetitive market. Uh, that's particularly important at the moment in relation to foodstuffs. Um, supermarkets, grocery stores have been closely looked at by the Commerce Commission and the need to maintain a high degree of competition between all those stores is um, recognised by the government. Sorry, is that, is, does that conclude your submission? Thank you, thank you. Any questions? Yep, Bill. Um, thanks very much, um, Ian. I, I, I have a question um, around the parts of your client's submission that talk that talks about the um, amount of alcohol-only transactions um, between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m., which is, I think, 0.88%. Uh, is your client, um, and it's probably not overt in the submission, um, suggesting that there potentially could be a differentiation um, in terms of hours between, say, supermarkets and grocery stores vis-a-vis -vis bottle stores? certainly consider that there could be such a differentiation. Uh, we consider that that's within the council's power and it may be that that's appropriate given the situation in your city, but that it will be a matter for you. 
What we see in relation to supermarkets and grocery stores is certainly that the sales of alcohol that take place before 10 a.m. are, as you've pointed out, almost exclusively as part of a broader grocery shop. It's people doing their family shopping and buying a bottle of wine or a six-pack of beer to go with that family shopping. That doesn't, of course, occur when people go to a bottle shop before 10 a.m. The only thing they will be buying there will be alcohol and, or perhaps a bag of nuts and a bag of chips. So it is a fundamentally different shopping trip that takes place before 10 a.m. in a bottle shop than what happens within a supermarket and a grocery store. And of course, if a, if a family does wish to buy wine or beer as part of their grocery shopping for the week, if they are needing to do that grocery shopping early in the morning because of work commitments or um, childcare, etc., then if they cannot buy that bottle of wine or beer in the supermarket when they go to do that shopping, they may well then move to a bottle shop later in the day at some point in order to buy that alcohol. And when once in a bottle shop, they are exposed then to the ability to buy spirits and RTDs, things which aren't available in the supermarket. Now that might sound at first, you might say, well, that's just foodstuffs trying to look after its own um, market share. But as you will have seen from the submission, Foodstuffs owns Liquorland, so Foodstuffs is a bottle shop owner as well. So that submission that I made is not um, driven by a need to maintain any particular market share. It's just simply a fact that people's shopping trips to supermarkets are a different exercise than their shopping trips to bottle shops, and therefore when looking at that early morning hour, they're quite different. Anything else? No, thank you very much, uh, Ian. Um, very full submission, thank you. Appreciate you coming and talking to us. Uh, and that brings us to Brian, sitting there very patiently. Come on up, Brian. Morena. I was in particularly interested with uh, Mark's comment uh, earlier about uh, taking our community back, and uh, that really uh, sort of uh, struck a, a note with me. And I just um, as a, a general com uh, commentary about our society at the moment, um, bad behaviour is ruling the roost um, because there aren't any um, uh, consequences of bad behaviour, and uh, that needs to be dealt with, whether it's out in the wider community or in the CBD um, or due to people preloading in non uh, in um, alcohol free zones on the strand and so on you know so there aren't any implications for this bad behavior and we've got to address that and I think we're um, proposing Main Street Tarongas are proposing to have a meeting with uh, with uh, parties in the next uh, couple of weeks uh, to actually try and uh, sort out the issues in the CBD anyway. Uh, Main Street Tauranga has previously submitted on this issue in detail and now supports the revised proposed changes in the revised draft LAP, and especially with regard to the criteria for unlicensed premises in the central city being the focus area of Main Street Tauranga's operations. Saying that, we also support in principle the proposed hardening of restrictions for off-licence sales of alcohol in the wider community. As noted in our previous, in our written submission and in my earlier verbal submission to the committee, the impact of the hospitality industry and the CBD wasn't broken, and the hospo industry, due to significant numbers of security personnel attached to each bar, was supposedly doing a great job of self-managing risk, both within their premises and outside where they, they were anticipating issues and diffusing problems. I was very disappointed to hear Mark's earlier comment regarding issues on the strand associated with some bars and, uh, and my following comments uh, may help to address that. Main Street is very pleased that the voices of the hospo industry and of Main Street have been heard with pragmatic decisions being made as reflected in the re revised pros changes in the draft LAP. Um, Technology solutions aside that Mark suggested, in our written submissions and as noted in my previous verbal 
presentation, the main issue and opportunity is to ensure that there is scheduled and regular communication between the hospitals, the local licensing authority and the police. As I understand it, these comms haven't improved and given that we are heading into the summer slash Christmas season, the parties should be getting together and discussing and planning for the increased hospo associated activity in the CBD and we will be, Main Street Tarong will be pushing very hard for that to happen. Um, so um, just in summary, that, that's my submission, no, nice and short and sweet. We support the proposed changes. Um, we know there are issues to be dealt with. We believe that um, uh, that um, vastly improved um, communication uh, between the parties is, is certainly the um, going to be a panacea for actually correcting the issues. And uh, and if any issues arrive arise, then um, the uh, hospos amongst themselves will um, also, as part of that communication process, be able to uh, deal with. Uh, what I'll say, a, a wayward bars if, if they're not controlling their uh, their operations and uh, and um, serving alcohol to people who shouldn't be served alcohol. So, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, uh, so, so I'm, I'm going back in history. I think you were here when Michael was talking earlier, uh, and he talked about the Strand Night Management Accord. Are you aware of that, or were you in were, were no. downtown Tauranga involved in that? No, no right. not that I'm aware of anyway. Right, because mm. I think that might be something that's worth collectively we have a look at, and whether um, you can't always. I mean, times change, but but it sounded like there were some really good elements there that we might be able to um, to to reinstate or 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 develop mm. um, for the future. Because I think like downtown Tauranga, I think the councils really concerned that we're spending a lot of ratepayers' money trying to revitalise the CBD and we want it to be a pleasant place where people can come yep. and enjoy themselves and feel safe, as Mark, mm. as Mark has pointed out. Mm. Um, any questions for Brian? Yes, Bill. Thanks, Brian. Um, and I note and you've referenced it and certainly in your written submission about Main Street strongly supporting the, the opening sales times for, for off licences at, at, at 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. Given that on licences have the ability to open earlier, I'd just be interested in Main Street's thinking um, around supporting a 10 a.m. for off licences, but obviously the ability for on licences to open earlier. Thanks for throwing that at me, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, personally, I think it should be consistent across the uh, community, so um, uh, that has been addressed by the board, but uh, that's my personal opinion that if you've got uh, one rule for the uh, off licences, it should be the same for the on licences. Anything else for Brian? Okay, thank you very much. And we have Elliot Fenton and Dawn Mertens from Toyota Oil. Good morning. So you've been sitting here listening, you know the routine. Welcome, and you know, about five minutes and maybe some questions. Um, thank you. Kia ora koutou, Nissan Bola Vinaka. I'm Dawn Mertens, um, Toyota Public Health Technical Officer. And kia ora koutou, ko Elliot Tuku, uh, Elliot Fenton Tuku Ingoa. So my name's Elliot Fenton, uh, a Health Improvement Advisor at Toyota. Um, you've all received our submission, um, so we won't go through the, the whole lot, but I'll just pick up some of the main points that we'd like to um, submit on orally this morning. So thank you anyway for the invitation to um, submit. Um, Toichiora's purpose, as we all know, is to improve and protect the health and well-being of the Tauranga Bay Plenty Lakes region for us. Um, ad alcohol has a significant adverse impact on well-being and safety and is a leading cause of disease and disability. It's also a well-known fact that Māori experience a disproportionate amount of alcohol-related harm compared to non-Māori and that this has been persistent. 
so that's research all attached um, for you to have had a look at already. Um, what we really want to stress in this submission is um, upholding te tiriti or watangi in alcohol law because it's, no long, it's not in the Act currently, but public health would like it stressed when we are dealing with it. For myself personally, as a licensing person representing the Medical Officer of Health, it's really difficult to put it in because we deal with just the Act. But um, in our everyday work with uh, health improvement, we try to put it in as much as we can. So it's important that alcohol policies within Aotearoa, Aotearoa districts are reflective of and uphold the integrity of te tiriti or waitangi. Māori experience a disproportionate level of alcohol-related harm, yet there are many barriers to Māori having a meaningful say in alcohol decisions that affect their communities. Therefore, policy action and decisions need to include input and guidance from local iwi to align policies that help support our Māori communities. Council can also align their LAP with Te Hiringa, Haura, Te Tiriti or Waitangi Aligned National Alcohol Harm Minimisation Framework. Now that's a huge mouthful, but it's, it um, was sent in. Which is a framework aspiring to create an Aotearoa free from alcohol-related harm. The framework is based on the World Health Organization's safer interventions to help reduce alcohol-related harm. The two pillars of action included alcohol policy and cultural change. This is important as it outlines the need for cultural guidance to create robust and suitable policies specifically around alcohol. Um, te Hiringa Haora is now part of Te Whatuora, so um, all their research is based there. 48% of Māori have shown to experience, to have insurance, experienced harm from others drinking. This even more so for females. Those in most deprived areas and our rangatahi, ages 18 to 24 years, this means that it is important that policy and legislation reduce barriers for Māori to participate in decision making on alcohol sales and marketing setting. This can be done by council working with and empowering whānau hapu iwi rupu so that they can meaningfully and effectively participate in the decisions about and determine what happens with alcohol in their communities. Um, and Elliot will just go on to Tuatura Public Health, our recommendations. Yeah, so therefore, Toy Tilda Public Health recommends the following changes to the Tauranga City Council LAP to improve the local environment and culture around consumption of alcohol to be considered and adopted. So the main one, upholding uh, the current one-way door policy in the last hour of opening for all premises that are open after 1am. Uh, the change to the final alcohol sales to 2am for all on-licensed premises such as bars and nightclubs in the central city. Um, permitted at off-licensed premises to sell alcohol after 10 a.m. and no new on-licensed premises to be established in the areas zoned industrial, no new bottle stores to be established in the areas with a deprivation index of seven or more, and include a range of discretionary conditions for off-licensed premises. The main part, as you see following that, is that Toyota did a, or Toyota Public Health did a survey in 2020 of the population uh, survey and it was reflective of the community's views across a range of public health topics relevant to the Bay of Plenty District. The alcohol-related findings showed the following that 63.2% of respondents support, the re support reducing the number of places that sell alcohol, that 59.5% of respondents support more restrictions on advertising and sponsorship by alcohol companies. 71.6% of respondents believe supermarkets and liquor stores should not be selling alcohol before 10 a.m and 62.7% of respondents believe that more restrictions on alcohol availability would improve safety in towns and cities at night. Therefore, these results indicate the community is, support is supportive of tighter regulatory measures to, measure, to manage issues such as alcohol, outlet density, sponsorship, trading hours, and availability. A strengthened LAP will help the council achieve the policy goal to reflect local communities' character, amenity, values, preferences and needs. The big part of, of our submission is that is the alcohol related harm. So Toy Public Health Intelligence Brief in the Appendix 1 of our submission outlines alcohol related harm within the Tauranga district. Of concern over the last 10 years the rate of admission to hospitals within conditions wholly attributed to alcohol has consistently been higher in Tauranga than the average rate for New Zealand. Furthermore, alcohol-related hospital admissions rates were calculated for 1,551 suburbs across the country. 
several suburbs within the Tauranga district rank within the highest 100 for the number of alcohol-related admissions according to the broad definition. The suburbs with the highest rates of alcohol admissions include Tauranga Central, Mount Monganui North, Tauranga South and Gate Pa. These comparatively high rates of alcohol-related ad hospital admissions provide good cause to strengthen the Tauranga City Council L LAP in conjunction with other measures to reduce alcohol-related harm. Tauranga has higher hospital admission rates than the national average due to the chronic alcohol use. This relatively high level of health impact is important because those within rural parts of the district that experience harm caused by acute alcohol will have to travel much further to access these hospital services. When, when we discuss um, hospital admissions um, wholly attributable to alcohol, and I don't want to teach anyone how to suck eggs, but it's basically alcohol only. So cirrhosis of the liver, you know, not domestic violence, any of that. And Tauranga sits in the top 6% of the country for those admissions. Um, and just, uh, ex just my own, I know I'm getting past the five minutes, but just my own experience from alcohol licensing and monitoring of the licensed premises, I'd like to stress that the one-way door system, because I cover the lakes and the bay region, regions, um, one-way door system actually helps. It assists in, in um, the migration of people from premises to premises where you end up having lots of um, fights. So when that was introduced 10 years ago um, because of LAPs, we even had it in Rotorua prior to the new act, um, it, it stopped people migrating from premises to premises after a certain time. And so you didn't have a lot of people hanging around in the streets. That's just my experience from one-way door policies, and I believe it should remain. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, and, and um, the MOH recommends that a uh, decision on the LAP um, uh, be held off until the Parliament's uh, decision on LAP. Any questions? Um, so thank you very much. Look, I, um, I, I'm a little disappointed that you didn't give us any credit for the fact that we do actually have representatives of Mana Whenua sitting here at the, at the decision table with us. Um, uh, you made the point in your submission that it needs to happen, but actually we have them here, um, and, and they play an active role in, in, the, in the process of both developing the LAP and, and, and the decision making on the LAP. So, uh, but that's Sorry, I'm, that's not what this meant at all. This was basically around the Act, not including yeah, well we, ha we, have no, we have no ability yep. to, to have control over the Act, but what we've done at local level is make sure that we have included oh, that voice. Absolutely, yep. and my apologies if that was taken that way. That's not, a, that's not what we meant at all. Right, okay, thank you. Um, so, so I do have a question, but I'll open it up to others first, but Bill, yeah. Thank you, and thanks for your submission. So um, this is... Um, a question to you, Dawn, because you, you spoke about it early on in your presentation. And in terms of the suggestion that we align um, the LAP with the, and I'm not going to say the full title, um, but the National Alcohol Harm Minimisation Framework. So are there any examples where that has occurred um, in other councils in terms of their LAPs? So that's my first question. And secondly, what, if such an alignment occurred, what does that mean for the um, local area alcohol policy? I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get a bit more of an understanding of what that would look and feel like in terms of the policy. Uh, my understanding of that, and um, we've had a, had a good look at it, um, and that's the second last page on the back there. And, and it's around, um, from what I understand, is... Hey? Yeah. And, and it's around when you've got policy change, you've also got the cultural change going on side by side. Um, and, and everything is aligned to the cultural change, the policy change. Um, without one, you don't have the other. Do you have something to add to that? So where 
that may have occurred in terms of other um, council jurisdictions in New Zealand? Yeah, I don't believe it has been introduced in other council legislation. The, the important part is, is, is that it's based from Te Tiriti or Waitangi. So it's about, yes, that, that important larger coalition of what happens in New Zealand. But it's it's about adapting it. What is the local council doing to uphold Te Tiriti or Waitangi? Yes, it's it's great to see the representatives here to have that part in it. But it's it's also about our fundamental or, or legislation that happens in a local district that is framed around policy change, around the culture change, from those pillars of Te Tiriti or Waitangi, so that we're providing the best and supportive environment for all those in our community. Ah, okay. Um, so, so my question was, um, so we heard from, I'm not sure, I think you were sitting here, we heard from the supermarkets who were, who were claiming that, um, based on their research in their, in their supermarkets, the vast majority of people purchasing alcohol uh, between 7 and 10 a.m. are buying it as part of their family, they didn't, it, there wasn't actually evidence that it was part of the family um, grocery, weekly grocery shop, but they were buying it with, with food um, and and th that made them different then from people who were going into a liquor store uh, to, to purchase liquor only and maybe a few nuts or chips. And I just really wanted to get some comment from you on that premise. Yes, I, I know Ian very well. We've uh, sat across the table many times. Um, you know, Ian, Ian, he's right in some ways, but I, in my experience I have seen people, for example in, in Rotorua, even in Tauranga, um, you will have the homeless going into supermarkets and purchasing the scrumpy early in the morning because it's cheap. You know, they have the 399 cans of alcohol and it is early in the morning. Bottle stores aren't open, it's near where they live, etc. But I don't believe I, and people do go shopping early in the morning. Um, that doesn't take away the fact that alcohol is available that early in the morning. And availability leads to increased alcohol-related harm. And there's research on that. Okay, any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Got Ash from Miss G's. Welcome, Ash. You've been sitting here, you know the rules. <laughs> you nervous. You've been here before, I'm you've normally, talked to us. Normally you know people us. Come <laughs> Um, good morning, um, my name is Ashley G and I'm the sole owner of Miss G's Bar and Eatery. Um, for those who are not aware, Miss G's is a bar, eatery and late night venue um, with a licence to sell alcohol from 9am to 3am daily. Oh, Melissa. Before getting into the items for discussion today, I would like to touch on what our CBD business owners are currently dealing with on the daily. We are currently spending a great deal of our time and money on trying to encourage people to visit our CBD a lifeline for our local business owners that have had to deal with blow after blow after blow since prior to COVID, throughout COVID, and now with the city centre left in pieces as we look to rebuild. When we are successful in getting customers in to visit us, we are then impacted by members of the community causing disruptions such as drug abuse, public displays of intoxication, and abuse thrown at patrons. I have personally been spat at and threats on my life being made in front of my customers, but yet I still get up every day and put efforts in to try and shine some light into our city centre. Like any hospitality experience, when you go somewhere and you have a bad experience, you're less likely to go back. My comments for the items of discussion today. As an operator that this directly impacts, removal of the one-way door policy would benefit our venues in the safe management of the guests, taking people off the street after 2am and inside controlled environments with trained staff, security and safe places for people to wait for public transport with less risk of unprovoked fights, creating a safer environment in our CBD in the early hours of the morning. 
our venue, <laughs> our venues are able to control who enters based on influence levels up until 2 a.m. And as part of our host responsibility policies, we are also tasked with ensuring our guests get home safely. Once a customer is locked out of our venue with friends left inside, we are left with groups of people starting to grow outside our doors, adding more strain on our security staff and duty managers. With the growing number of travellers coming into the bay, we are ha having a steady incline of refusing patrons, leaving them to walk the streets as they do not understand why they are not allowed to enter a venue. Many of these guests do not drink, but have a, lo a love for music and nightlife, which stems from their culture, and it's not just about alcohol. With regards to the change of sale times for off-licenses, I believe this is a step in the right direction and note the government has recognised the need for local communities to have more input around this. One of the biggest issues throughout New Zealand is the preloading and binge drinking culture and based on the total alcohol sales in New Zealand every year coming from our off-licence premises, I think more ownership and acknowledgement needs to come from big corporations that are sending booze out their doors. My licence allows the sale of alcohol from 9am. We open at 12, so alcohol can be served with, served with food responsibly, as per our requirements. Supermarkets sell necessities, your everyday items. When we position alcohol alongside necessities, what message are we giving our communities and our children that are growing up seeing this every day? How much business is, re is it really going to cost our off-licence premises if we restrict sales until 10 a.m.? Yes, a headache, man uh, headache management-wise in our supermarkets, but we have been talking about alcohol harm and binge drinking culture in New Zealand for many, many years, yet nothing has changed in respect to how alcohol is sold by the major players. In a venue, I see my customers regularly, and at off-licence premises, you may be lucky to see the same customer once a month, if that user is smart. At Miss G's, I get to know our customers and can sense when something is escalating in alcohol usage. I have conversations with people asking, is everything okay? How are you going? I've noticed you're in here a lot lately. Is everything all right? Do you want to talk about it? Off the back of these conversations, I have seen changes, changes in people's behavior and have been thanked for reaching out, some now living a sober life. Selling alcohol is a huge responsibility and impacts our communities. I think if Tauranga and New Zealand want to move in the right direction, and reduce alcohol harm, alcohol needs to be removed from supermarkets altogether and place these specialty items just in specialty stores. Regarding new, no new licences being approved in industrial zones, I'm not, um, I must admit I didn't read the um, specs, um, but I'm not entirely sure what the vision is for developing areas on the city and Mount Fringes, um, but from personal experiences overseas, industrial zone buildings were snapped up regularly by breweries, distilleries and event spaces that we utilised large buildings to create high quality hospitality venues. By restricting further licences to be approved could lead to stamping out a popular niche of offerings. Perhaps a look at a, look at a way we can ensure those who seek a licence in industrial zones have a separate set of requirements they need to fulfil, including provisions of how they can give back to our communities. Miss G sponsors many local clubs and gives back to the ways gives back in ways to our communities. Rising Tide is a good example of a large industrial building utilised to create a fun, family oriented hospitality offering. No new bottle stores uh, in areas with deprivation of seven or more. Firstly, highly agree, but these areas are not just the issue we can, when you can just drive down the road to another suburb and purchase there. We have enough bottle stores or access to alcohol, period. Google bottle shop Tauranga, and I counted at least 15 bottle stores on this side of the bridge, some within a couple of hundred metres apart. If our goal is to reduce alcohol harm and consumption, why are we continuing to add more wood to the fire? Back to the closing times of our CBD. With the extreme amount of investment we're currently putting in to recreate our city and take it from a ghost town to pumping, I think we need to hold off on any decision being made around this time. How do we know what the impact of the renovations is going to do to the CBD? We won't know until the major projects like Civic Centre and the waterfront are completed. For those who do not have any hospitality experiences, people bring people. Bring people. The more people we have in the CBD, the more vibrancy we could have. If after all the changes are done and the CBD is still the same, then I don't think we will, we will have any late night bars to worry about anyway as they will be closed. The main issue we have here is a lack of communication and disjointed or no management. People want to feel safe when they go out. 
This is something the current state of the CBD does not provide, and our focus should be on mitigating this first before shutting down the bars. I noticed we are still employing three security guards daily to sit at the relocated bus stops, but most of the troublemakers now know that the guards have no authority and do not respect them. Can we not put some of this money spent here into providing a late night city vibe management like other city centres have? Since the first hearing around this subject, I have personally adopted a last drinks call at 2.30am at Miss G's. This has seen a dramatic drop in the number of guests we have exiting Miss G's around 3am. By this time, most people have dispersed and obtained transport home. The main issues I can see in the, around the CBD after dark are the public displays of drinking, drinking in cars, and patrons arriving fueled up after drinking a box at home for 26 bucks. We simply do not have enough police, and I think if they feel less stretched, we could work together to rebuild a positive nightlife for the CBD. On a positive note, the small increase in police presence has been noticed since the hearing earlier this year, and I'd like to thank Dan and his team for, for providing opportunities to learn and become better operators. Um, Ms G's was deemed to miss the mark on one particular occasion, but off the back of this and the learning opportunities Dan has provided to me, I have since been able to improve our operations even further to ensure we continue to grow our strengths. It shows having communication and learning can cre create better venues. One major issue I can see in the incoming uh, coming up is the access to taxis or transport home once the Civic, the civic Centre and Masonic developments begin, resulting in only one taxi stand for everyone to merge into and get home on a street that already has issues. Transport needs to be sorted before we walk into a storm. Discretionary conditions for off-licence premises, um, if, if these result in better management of alcohol sales and providing better training and regulation of promotions, then I agree. There are many bottle stores that take their businesses seriously and professionally, but there is also a large number that do not care and every sale is just money in the till. It is too cheap and too easy to drink at home. For people suffering from alcohol addiction, this is the place that they will be drinking. Tauranga is in a transition phase with the renovations and I think any drastic changes while this process should, is happening should be done with great confidence. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Ash. Any questions for Stephen? Thank you. Thank you for your submission. I was interested in your decision to uh, have early drinks at 2.30. Um, and I guess the, uh, I'm curious as to whether or not that has a significant, the earlier close off has a significant impact on turnover. Um, acknowledging your um, contribution to actually creating a vibrant city, and uh, I agree with the essence of your, your submission, uh, but we want to do that in a fun, safe way. So would earlier closure make such a significant difference to turnover? Is the heart of my question, and you'll have experience on that on, on the 2.30 closure. Um, so the current way that the city plays out is everyone goes over to the mount, tanks up the mount, jumps in the cars, comes over to the CBD um, and enjoys the later, the later um, closing times of the CBD. Um, with the one-way door close off at two, uh, we're left with the current customers that we've got in the bar for the last hour kind of thing. Um, so we took it as upon ourselves to do the 2.30 close just to cr try and see how many people are actually drinking after the two o'clock kind of thing. Um, and we get a lot of people coming from the Mount and other places that work in hospitality and finish their shifts at 1am and then want to go out with their friends and things like that, coming across and enjoying that late, later thing. So they're normally only coming in for one drink. Um, we don't really see a massive um, impact but we're normally kind of putting, you know, people are slowing up by that time anyway. It's more about um, them having the night with their friends um, and we've got all the travellers now that are used to kind of partying until 4am in the morning um, and um, are not, I'm used to having dinner at 10 o'clock at night. So um, I don't know what it's going to be like with them because they actually haven't traded through that process before. I, I take it from that then consistency of closure. I mean, it, 
is an advantage at the moment for your business and that people will come back, but in principle, would you support consistency of closing hours between the two locations? If we, if Tarong shuts at the same time the Mount shuts, then you won't get the crossover and the CBD, will, the bars that are left there basically, I would see them as being closed until the CBD is back into the, the pumping vibe that we're expecting it to be. Um, and then, yeah, it's hard to say what that will look like. Um, I'm just interested in um, your commentary around the um, you're not supporting the proposed change in respect of the industrial areas and not having um, bars and facilities in there. Do, do you um, see just going back to the current um, arrangements or are you looking for some type of planning change or policy direction in terms of the nature of facilities in the industrial area? I would, like, this is based on my experience from overseas and things like that and, like, what you see around is the, the industrial buildings were all vacant or they were taken up by kind of new hotspot hot hotspots and things like that and then that grew to mixed use residential developments being surrounded those areas as the city grew too big in the city and had to move out to the city fringe. Um, so I lived in Brisbane. It was impossible to pay rent, rent in Brisbane for bars and things like that, so they looked for the city fringe. Um, if, it, if they're run right and, you know, the operators are good at, and, and you have, like, a plan of what the business is going to be like, um, the likes of Rising Tide and those things, they, they do work. But I think if we kind of stamp it out early on, we're left with the CBD um, and the rates of the CBD going up and things like that, that hospitality just won't be able to afford with what we've got going on in the moment. It's a bit like Tony Bish buying, um, going into um, Napier, into the industrial area there and creating a, not only a winery but a wine bar. It's that, that sort of... Yeah, okay. Essentially, like transform areas built around places for people to eat. Thanks very much. See, it's it's not it's not hard. <laughs> um, okay. Oh. So so we got Susan Hodg Hodgkinson. We got is she, oh, you with us? Right. Can you hear me? Kora koutou. My name's Sue Hodkinson and I pick up litter. We've normalised alcohol. We've normalised litter. I listened to uh, Tony Street on the night pro programme and she, she talks about wine all the time. In the morning they talk about wine on the news. Uh, some of the ads still talk about wine. I got hold of Chloe Swarbrick and said, your, your um, bill in front of Parliament doesn't go far enough. You have to, you will, I think you need to couple up with waste management and behavioural change. We're, we've got a real issue in Tauranga. We've got an alcohol issue in Tauranga. I'm not talking about the CBD, but last week I came with my two-year-old granddaughter to go and see Harry McCleary. There was broken glass all through the playground. And it's so hard to find a, when you're carrying broken glass, to find a rubbish tin. There's, there's one there. And there were bottles all down the, down the railway line. So I said, oh, come on, this is too dangerous. Let's go and have, cup, have lunch. So we went over by the toilet, and there was the little seat. And there were just bottles and bottles and bottles and I got really angry 
and I am still really angry. My two-year-old granddaughter knows more about litter than probably anyone else in this room except me. Two years old, couldn't go to Harry McCleary. Two years old, couldn't have lunch because of bottles. This is Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning at the Mount. And it's not the people that stay in the bars. It's the people that can't get into the next bar because they're too drunk. It's the people that preload. I live in the Blake Park area of Mount Monganui. When the cricket's on, you have 40 and 50 year olds absolutely intoxicated, but breaking their bottles on the way around the corner to Kaiwaka Street or around the corner to Meadow Street, depending which way they go. It is absolute mess and New Zealand cricket clean up the stadium beautifully. Bay Dreams. Bay Dreams contaminates the whole city. Wherever their bus stops are, even if you are in a, in a liquor ban area, there is alcohol. That's a hell of a lot. Under the flyover. Hewlett's Road flyover yesterday. Wasn't there the day before. I clean now, because I'm stupid, from Grove Avenue to Concord Avenue. Yet that takes in Kiwi Rail, it takes in NZTA. Up to take up to Golf Road is New Zeal is, is the Tauranga City Council. But there are so many orange cones, it can't be cleaned. The funny thing is that all through the week, orange cones don't get, don't get bowled over. Friday night into Saturday morning, all around where I live, at Mount Monganui, they are all down. Is that on purpose or is it because of intoxication? Where are the police? Where is the security? What you haven't got in here are the four glasses, wine glasses and beer glasses that I took back to Mount Mellick yesterday morning. Oh, how did they get out? You're not allowed to go out with wine glasses, but because their staff keeps changing, they don't know who I am and I'm always taking bottles and the glasses where they are, are, um, say where they've come from, where they, they're sourced, back to the bars. Mount Brewing Company. Mount Social Club. The Mount Mellick are the main offenders and the brewing company is a long way from Grove Avenue. Rising Tide is really good. Don't close down Rising Tide. So I was really naughty in my submission, it was about a page and a half long, and I said I'd quite like that they can't go out of any bars after 11. That would really suit me. But what I really want, Tauranga, is that you are not allowed to have an open alcohol bottle walking or in your car like Canada does. Kerry Kerry is clean of alcohol. The band is supported. But you go across to Openoni and it isn't. Openoni is full of bottles like Tauranga in the Mount. Broken bottles on the footpath, broken bottles on the new cycleways, but broken bottles are always on cycleways. The cycleways don't get swept. And the gutters at the mount don't really get swept because there's cars where I live and, it, you know, it, they're just horrible. And the new beautiful, beautiful islands down the Mount Monganui Road, I clean them every morning at five o'clock. Some of these come from there. Same places, same people, over their heads. But if they're driving, it's straight out the window. They might smash on the road or they might get to the island. I am tired of this laissez-faire. I'm tired of New Zealand's laissez-faire. I'm tired of Tauranga's laissez-faire. Here's your beautiful place. Come on, two cruise ships, come in. I was ashamed. We've had two cruise ships in. 
I clean, I was cleaning up before the cleaners, and I don't even know if they came, Marine Parade. The buses were coming out with the cruise ship people on, and Marine Parade was looking after like it had an, a, a huge concert with lots of alcohol. Two weekends in a row that the cruise ships came in. Tauranga City Council, you did a wonderful job, or your contractors did, the day before Labour weekend. Friday, it was wonderful. I felt really happy. You and, you and your contractors and me, really happy. Saturday morning, I have never seen, except for New Year's Day last this year, so much glass. Last weekend, the Mount Monganui market took an hour to set up because of the broken bottles in what I'm going to call the Tucka Tucka Papa, whatever it is, park of the disconsent. It's not good enough. I'm going to be 73. What's going to happen? I won't live in a slum. Blake Park is over capacity. Nobody cleans up properly after a cricket match. Nobody cleans up properly in the neighbourhood. The neighbourhood has to do it. But most people in the neighbourhood have now normalised litter. Thank you, Sue. You do a really good job. I say you need to do it too. Adopt your gutter. Adopt your stormwater drain. Please adopt the boom in front of your house. And they look at me like I'm nuts. We have a behavioural problem in Aotearoa, and we have it in Tauranga. And I've written my submission, but what I haven't said, because I don't know if it's in your power yet, but maybe Chloe Swarbrick's bill can make it in the power, even though it doesn't go that far, about no alcohol on the streets. That stops the backpackers across the road from me from preloading down to the Melick and drinking all the way home, and sitting outside my boob at half past three in the morning having a party because they've stashed the stuff. Got nothing more to say? Thank but you, Sue. Thank you. Um, uh, look, I mean, we all know you do a great job. The good news is I was driving to work the other morning along, um, uh, actually, it was, I think it was Papamoa Beach Road, and there were two people out there also picking up rubbish. Yeah, there's a few of us. So there's, 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 there's and there's a few of us up. up we the need mount. a few more. Uh, we need, we need like tidy Taupo. Yeah. We need. Yeah. There's well, a thousand, and they get a free coffee at the at the Taupo we've, council. We've had that conversation. We'll just focus on the alcohol part this today. But well, the, the problem is the alcohol yes. part. Yeah. Out of. Four bags that I might pick up earlier in the morning on the way to the sunrise, three of them are recyclable, and we haven't got enough recyclable bins. Yep. All we need is glass yep. Yep. No, and I'll, aluminium. We've got all that. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. Okay, Sandy. Sandy Watkins from Super Liquor Holdings. Thank you. Good morning. Okay, thank, thank you for the opportunity um, to speak here, and I'm representing Superliga Holdings. I'm the franchise manager for the Bay of Plenty area. Uh, obviously, my stores are in Tauranga. I'm going to go over a few key summaries of the submission. First one, um, the hours. Superliga doesn't support the hour changes. Um, a lot of our stores won't open till 10, or some of them even later. Some do open earlier, but it gives the stores the ability to prepare um, trade orders, sell them, put them through the till before 10 o'clock. Um, so we don't, we don't support that. I, I listened to Ian talk about uh, potential off-licenses having different um, opening hours. We, we think that all off-licenses should be treated the same. The proposal for not allowing any bottle stores to be established in some areas across the city. We do not support this bill, uh, this proposal. Um, 
the reason is currently the Act gives you the opportunity and we've got to look at every um, case uh, on its own merits. Um, Ash talked about certain industrial areas where there's a potential. Um, Michael talked about the opportunity in an area where someone wants to open up an off-premise to do a business and have some discretion. Currently the Act provides that in the hearing situation and I think we need to keep this. We think we need to keep this. Uh, yes, yeah, so everything should be judged on its own merit and uh, not be um, judged on an overriding provision. So on to this uh, proposal of um, the additional range of discretionary conditions for off-licence premises. Uh, we, we do agree with uh, a few of them. I'm going to just talk to a couple. The um, single sales of beer and RTD and no single sales of shots. Um, these are legal products deemed by M um, MP MPI and we think that these restrictions uh, should be covered by the Act. If they do come into a position of um, banned in an off-premise situation, it has to be across all off-premise. Everyone has to be treat treated the same. Restrictions of displays of RTDs and restrictions of sales based on the type of products. These things are quite hard to manage. Um, especially with the size of some stores and the layout of some stores. It can be hard to enforce and important items should be included as part of the Act. Recently, a few years ago now, they reduced the standard, si standard size that you could sell of an RTD and reduced the to two standard drinks. Discretion is dangerous and open to interpretation of how these conditions are are applied can be hard. Again, we want a level playing field across all off-premise. Thank you. Thanks very much. Can you um, can you tell me why you think? So you disagree with the uh, proposal to ban sales of um, single shots. What do you think is the motivation of someone who comes in and buys a single shot? S a single shot? Um, so I guess it's the uh, pre-mixed single shot, not a miniature. Um, we, we, there's a bit of clarification that needs there, but a lot of these times they're actually sold in a four-pack anyway. Not, not many people will break them down. Potentially as a condition, um, and, and I've seen them on some licences where it's, uh, I think Ian mentioned the pack that this, the um, supplier actually makes them, it's sold in that. Uh, the people that do buy singles or sometimes do get offered to buy a single shot are probably buying it as an additional purchase and taking it out. Anyone else have any, any questions? No? Yeah, Bruce, sorry, yes. Bruce. No, no worries, Bruce Robertson, I don't have a name tag, so, so there right. we go. <laughs> I just wanted to just check your first point, uh, which was about about the idea of seven or ten and wanting consistency of ours. Um, and I think you were describing what generally your staff might do in that time. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could just repeat that, please. And also, whether you have any reflection, how many customers generally you'd experience in a super liquor shop prior to ten o'clock in the morning. In my experience, a lot of our stores open at ten. Uh, a lot of stores will prepare um, a lot of orders. So your hours of uh, operation, uh, your hours on your licences when you can sell alcohol. So you, you can't ring up trade orders, you can't get ready to go out to the bars, you can't deliver before that 10 o'clock. So that, that adds some complexity, right? Yeah. So uh, stores that open at 9 o'clock, what are we doing? Um, stock taking, doing your general day-to-day -day stuff. You, you know, there's not a lot of people there, but you're open, there's, a, there's staff in the store um, preparing for the day. Anything else? Thank you very much. Sandy, is it? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Melissa Renwick from BOP Hospitality on, online. 
So I just, I just, just too far away for me to read. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. You got me there. Yep, we have. We can hear you loud and clear. When you're Fantastic. ready. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for having me this morning. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to present to you. Uh, my name is Melissa Renwick. I am from Hospitality New Zealand uh, and the Regional Manager for the Bay of Plenty area. Uh, additionally online today we've got Jonathan Alvey who is our National Operations Manager uh, just in case there are any uh, additional questions or information he can provide but I will do the, the, the bulk of the presentation today. Um, look, we appreciate you hearing the oral submission. Um, so we presented at the last round uh, as well uh, of the hearing, and um, and in the first instance, uh, you know, I think we we made our position pretty clear last time around. But we really want to thank you for supporting that in terms of the on license space um, and the fact that we truly do believe that on licenses are the safest places to consume alcohol. Um, it is uh, a monitored environment. It is a supervised environment. Um, and we have a lot of regulation and controls on our operators to assist in the safest delivery of that product. Um, there are a couple of things I just want to, um, I guess, flesh out a wee bit today uh, in terms of how um, we, bet we think we can best support um, development moving forward. Um, there are a couple of current tools that we really want to see utilised better, um, and, the and that is in order to obviously improve those alcohol harm outcomes. First one is engagement, most definitely. So in terms of licensees and the tri-agency, um, there was a mention earlier, I've forgotten the gentleman's name, who was talking about the um, nighttime accord. Uh, there is definitely discussion at present to re-establish an accord. Um, we've had the engagement of operators, or the operators are very much keen to do so. Um, and licensing, have, have, uh, the council have come on board as well and have said, yes, they're very keen to be involved in that discussion. Um, so we're just looking to get further engagement with both health and police on that. Uh, and get everybody around the table to have those conversations, particularly leading into this busy period, but as an ongoing matter, so that if there is anything of concern, these things can be discussed uh, openly with each other and find better ways of operating together if there are significant concerns. So that's definitely on the table, um, and we're certainly keen to see that and help facilitate that to, ha to happen. Uh, the second component is we really would like to see some proactive policing in these liquor van areas. Um, and we appreciate that the police force is stretched at present, and I do not have a solution for that. Um, but certainly in terms of understanding the impact, um, the bars absolutely without doubt that the downtown area is a draw card. We want people coming there. We want it to be a vibrant area. Uh, but what we are, of course, seeing is some of the preloading, um, the drinking in unlicensed and unregulated areas. And that's why we're such a big supporter of on license, is simply because it removes that unsupervised nature of trying to consume out of the back of a car or whatever it might be in the car park or the local park. So certainly maximising our, our liquor van areas is definitely of support, uh, has our support. Taking on board the discussions from both this forum and previous ones nationally, um, the industry is really focused on lifting the standards of operators all the time. Um, one of the biggest things that we've done most recently, and, and I think it's been released since we had our, our last presentation, is we have released a responsible service of alcohol standards now this is an online training course that we are putting all our members um, and their teams through in order to get a, gr a greater and more regular um, training, solid quality training in front of um, teams that are in this position where they're dealing with difficult people or um, you know, pe challenging people and, and potentially um, identifying and understanding how to better identify and manage intoxication. So all those things are happening um, from an industry level. I had an in-person, a couple of in-person host responsibility sessions um, with operators over the last couple of months, both in Tauranga and the Mount, um, and they were well attended. Uh, nationally, we've had about 700 go through those courses on um, venues and uh, responsible service of alcohol standards has about 1,000. So we're getting some good numbers through. Um, the local session I did, Tauranga CBD, had six different venues present with their staff. Um, so we're getting some really good engagement, and operators want to do the right thing, and I think that's the biggest thing to, to point out. They've engaged and spent a lot of money in security, and having that feature um, you know, that's, it's a significant investment for an operation to have those people out there, but it shows their commitment, I think, to ensuring that, um, that they are doing the right thing and that we're, we're making those communities safer and doing what we can to support that. So, look, we really appreciate the decisions that you've made so far in the, in the on-license space um, and obviously continue to support that. And I guess the, the sort of the summary is just simply that whatever we can do as an industry to support, um, you know, reducing that alcohol harm, uh, then we're absolutely open to doing so and engaging in those conversations. And so we want to see that um, that level of engagement improve and, and be a part of it. And that pretty much sums me up, I think. 
Thank you, thank you very much for that, Melissa. And it's really good to hear that you've picked picked that up. And I think, from the commissioner's point of view, um, we've got a considerable amount of interest in how that develops. And we've got police um, talking to us later, so we will take it up with them. It is a consistent theme that though that is coming through. We all and everyone says we know the police was um, resources are stretched, but it is that um, wider community behaviour and monitoring and management that is, is emerging for us. But yeah, that's just a, an observation to date. Um, any questions for Melissa? No, thank you very much. No hard questions um, to, to have to pass on, but we've got your submission and, and we know where you are and we really appreciate the efforts that you're making, um, particularly around lifting the standard with operators. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, okay, so that brings us to Paul Radich from General Distributors. Ah, there we are. Yes, Good morning. Please. So you've got about five minutes, and then we might have a few questions for you, Paul. But um, welcome, and thanks for coming, or thanks for making yourself available. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, we're a little disappointed that our submission wasn't included in the submission pack. Um, even though our submission had been acknowledged by the Tauranga District Council uh, and we weren't advised that the submissions were being made today. We only um, found out when we proactively followed up with the Council. Uh, having, so having spent most of the night uh, reviewing the submissions on the LAP, I wish to make the following points. Uh, discretionary conditions require two things before they can impose, evidence or an agreement from a licensee. The discretionary conditions you're seeking to to uh, impose limit the displays of where a product can go, what products can be sold, and a range of other matters, including CCTV cameras. So because, because they're in the LAP doesn't mean that they can be imposed, and, and the council doesn't have the right to prohibit particular legal products. Uh, I guess the point I would make here is where communities have come to me as the National Alcohol Responsibility Manager, and, and outlined a genuine concern around a particular range of products. Uh, we have removed them uh, <clears throat> and we are currently working with a number of councils around the country in terms of products that are causing them concern. <clears throat> the reality is there's no evidence uh, before the council uh, or the committee um, from these nine ide unidentified submitters that these conditions are targeting a particular mischief of any kind. The original officer's report recommended that there was no change to the LAP, and it appears that there's been a, uh, the commissioners have been uh, influenced by the data from the various health studies. Uh, Dr. Lane's submission refers to hospital admission data, and it's not really clear to me why that data ends in 2018. Um, the, the population survey data that was uh, also referred to um, <coughs> basically references that there's only 60% of people surveyed in the Bay of Plenty District Health Board, so roughly 600 people. That's not a compelling sample in order to change the hours of stores so significantly and so starkly. With that said, we're quite open to having a constructive and open conversation about changing the hours of our stores. But you can't ignore the submissions and the vast number of submissions uh, that have been made to the council in relation to the hours as they relate to supermarkets <coughs> uh, who strongly disagree with the proposed hours. The final point <coughs> I would like to make is we are open to having meaningful dialogue with the council. We've We've never made any bones about that. That is the, the whole principle on which we operate, and it reflects our social licence to operate. The changes that are imposed or suggested here, uh, in my view, go too far, and they're not supported. And from my, my team's perspective, uh, they are left in the position of having to explain to customers who legitimately want to purchase alcohol and who aren't influenced by alcohol-related harm, why they can't. That's our primary opposition to the, the proposal as it stands. Uh, I'm open to happy to answer any questions. 
Uh, thank you very much, Paul. And I can only apologise uh, for the um, missing of your submission, but we've all got your submission. Um, so I'll uh, open it up. Has anyone got any questions for Paul? Yep, Phil. Um, thanks, Paul. Um, were you online when um, um, foodstuffs were undertaking their presentation? Okay. Another meeting, so no, I missed, uh, I'm assuming it's Mr. Thane's presentation. It, it was, was indeed. And so, I'm just asking you um, the same question I asked him, um, and and that related to um, were foodstuffs in that example looking for potentially a differentiation in terms of ours between supermarkets and grocery stores vis-a-vis. Um, bottle stores. So I just wanted to pose a, the, the same question to you. Yeah, so I think I think my answer to that is from the submissions I've read, that's what your community is asking for. Um, I'm not sure that that's... Uh, I think there is stark differentiation between uh, supermarkets and bottle stores. I think there now needs to be some form of alignment, but having listened to the gentleman from Super Liquor just before, his stores don't open until 10 o'clock. Our stores open at 7 o'clock. So in terms of managing customers through that period, that's a problem for us where it's not a problem for bottle stores. Uh, so I think there needs to be some differentiation between supermarkets and uh, bottle stores. Uh, but certainly... Uh, we're not opposed to a closer alignment of ours, even if they're not exactly the same. Anything else for Paul? All right. Thank you very much. And as I say, we have your we we do now have your submission. Uh, okay. So that um, so that brings us to the police and we're going to ha are we having that in open? Yeah, no, sure. right. Okay, so that brings us to uh, Dan uh, and the New Zealand Police. So m a five, oh, gonna five, well, yeah, we have been going quite a while. Alright, so uh, are you alright if we just have five minutes? Take five minutes? Okay. So, yep, where are we? Oh, it's 11.34, right, so let's have a five minute break, well, you know, 11.41, you can have an extra. <laughs>
right, so I think we're I think we're all back, and um, so we have Dan Rosa from the from the New Zealand Police uh, to make their submission. Closed up my submission. So welcome. Um, you've been sitting here listening to the various ones, so you know about five minutes. We might have some questions, uh, and then we'll go into public excluded. Sure. Good morning, all. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you uh, today about the Taranga Local Alcohol Policy. Um, <clears throat> we have submitted. You'll have those submissions, so I won't go over those in depth, uh, but some thoughts uh, for you. Um, the intelligence report submitted shows that Taranga is the epicentre of police recorded incidents and offences where alcohol is a contributing factor. Um, at the last hearing, I did mention alcohol contributing factor data. Uh, has been uh, gathered by police since two thousand August two thousand nineteen. Uh, it's only recently come out that there's a depth of data enough to do some analysis on it. So the alcohol contributing factor uh, data shows that the Taranga CBD is the epicentre of alcohol offending. That's the map which will be on the intelligence report, um, showing that the Taranga CBD is is what's referred to as a hotspot. Uh, the LAP must consider the nature and severity of alcohol-related problems arising in the district. That's in Section 78 of the Act. <coughs> um, of note, the temporal distribution of alcohol-related demand peaks on a Friday and Saturday nights between about 9.30pm and 3am. That you'll see in the IR. There's all that chart there. Um, the depth of colour is the uh, number of incidents and so on. It's a 24-hour clock down here, days of the week. Uh, so it starts to peak uh, between 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. Uh, that's natural and reflected in most places. Uh, the situation is similar between Mount Maunganui Precinct and the Tauranga CBD. However, the magnitude is higher in the Tauranga CBD and occurs slightly later than the peak in Mount Maunganui. And that's consistent with the differing um, licensing hours. So the blue line on the IR will be the Tauranga incidents and offences alcohol contributing factor uh, being much higher in magnitude than the Mount Maunganui uh, entertainment precinct with its bars and slightly earlier, uh, so slightly later in peak. Um, that's a Tauranga only data and you'll see the peak there is between sort of 2 to 3 a.m. in the morning. And the Mount Maunganui uh, data, as you'll see, it starts to rise at around about 11 p.m. and is at its peak at around midnight to one, which is their closing time, and then drops off. Uh, this scale on the side, which is the magnitude, has changed. Don't don't look at the heights of the lines comparatively. That's the the scale is different. <coughs> um, in relation to the vibrancy of the Tauranga CBD, we hear a lot about that but I do point to uh, Mount Wanganui Entertainment Precinct as being vibrant and thriving and commercially successful. Uh, the reputation of the Mount Wanganui Entertainment Precinct uh, I submit is um, regarded as better than the Tauranga CBD. Um, so it is evidence that earlier closing times uh, can still lead to successful, thriving, commercially viable businesses. Police support the submissions made by <coughs> Dr Nikki Jackson and Alcohol Health Watch with regard to the research showing the correlation between the consumption of alcohol and fatigue that comes with later licensing hours and the onset of intoxication which can lead to a reduction of inhibitions towards aggression and violence. Police recognise this reality through observations almost every weekend. Police also support the submissions made by the Medical Officer of Health regarding the rate of hospital admissions uh, with hospitalisations, uh, conditions wholly attributable to alcohol being consistently higher in Tauranga than the average rate of New Zealand. This is why L uh, local alcohol policies were legislated for in, in the Act and allow councils to apply nuanced conditions to their area. Police recognise that violent offences can and do occur in the entertainment precinct despite the overt presence of police officers, which is a clear indication that intoxication Intoxicated persons are disinhibited to a high degree. Police submit that the licensing hours for on-licensed premises in the Tauranga CBD set pursuant to the local alcohol policy should be 2am. Uh, this would work towards the object of the Act and assist to reduce alcohol-related harm. 
Police believe that the local alcohol policy is the appropriate way to set a level playing field for businesses operating in the Tauranga CBD. I have spoken to the licensees of three CBD bars who, have, who concur that a level playing field is a desired situation. Police are aware that the opposition from licensees to a change in the local alcohol policy to a 2am closing with the associated one-way door adjustment to 1am was, in their opinion, commercially damaging. Police would be accepting of a 2am licence closing time without a one-way door policy if, that, uh, if the 2am closing was to be the case. I have spoken to the licensees of those three CBD bars regarding the issue and they advised that there would be unlikely opposition if that were the case. That is not an exhaustive list of the licensees. Caveat that. Um, the long standing and current situation regarding the amenity and good order of the Tauranga CBD late at night, particularly the Fridays and Saturday nights, is at times unpleasant and unsafe. This is in contrary to the Council's desired community outcome of an inclusive city, allowing people to feel safe in their homes, neighbourhoods, and public places. This has caused damage to the reputa reputation of the Tauranga CBD, which police believe may influence earlier trading businesses, such as restaurants, through their dining trade, as potential customers decide on other locations in preference. I heard a uh, submitter this morning, um, Mark, um, state that he has been down there and he talked about the body language of people during the day being quite defensive. Any movements to improve the situation would possibly improve the commercial prospects for businesses within the CBD. To speak metaphorically in a dramatic sense, if the place is burning, pouring more alcohol on the fire does not help. Um, Wakatani bars changed their closing time of the CBD bars. Uh, now Wakatani is a smaller area, naturally. Um, since the last lap hearing, um, I inquired with our intel team to do some similar mapping for the Wakatani area because there was a change in hours down there uh, to see if there was a change. Uh, that IR has been uh, submitted to you as well. Um, that change being from 2am, which was their local alcohol policy, to midnight. Um, this was a particular bar in question which was a case put before the ALA, uh, the Alcohol Regulatory Licence Authority, and had their hours ch uh, changed to midnight. Police reported a dramatic decline in the incidence of disorder since the change in hours. Uh, police predict that a real and appreciable reduction in crime and disorder is likely to occur in the Tauranga CBD should the trading hours be changed to 2am. An associated improvement in the amenities, safety and perceptions of safety in the city is likely to follow. The Minister of Justice has recently announced proposed changes to the alcohol legislation providing more support to councils. This clearly signals that progressive, proactive and courageous actions need to be taken. I've heard calls for even earlier closing times to minimise alcohol harm, and I therefore submit that the 2am position sought by police is well reasonable. Um, I have prepared a, uh, a small selection uh, of clips for you, which we'll cover shortly. Um, and I'm open to any questions you may have. Thanks, Dan. Um, so the, the one question I guess I have for you is that you've been here listening and uh, I don't know whether you were here right at the beginning when, when we heard from Ngā Pōtiki and, and Michael Mills, um, but he talked of uh, a strand night management accord that used to be in place um, and we've since heard from the Hospitality Association that uh, they are trying to work with operators and the council and and I guess the other leg of that stool would be the police. Um, and at the same time we've heard a lot about the behaviour of people who are not even anywhere near the bars but are in the car parks. And so, so I guess my question to you is we can do a lot of work on an LAP policy um, and, and, and we have to do that. But if we want a safe and inclusive community, particularly in the CBD, we're going to need everyone working together. Uh, and, I, and, and we've heard it today from people that police are short of resources, although I hear in today's, I heard on the radio this morning, we've got four coming out of the um, um, uh, graduation today, coming to the Bay of Plenty, so let's hope we get our fair share of those. 
are the police happy to be involved if, if something like that old accord was reinstated or put in place or some, you know, a modern version of it? Are the police, do the police have the um, ability to take part in that in a meaningful way? Because, because at the end of it, it's actually the police who have the powers um, over some of the behaviour that, that even the licensees can't control. <clears throat> um, 100% communication is always a big part of policing, uh, always open to uh, having fair and open communication with the licensees, but I, I do hear that put forward all the time as the panacea to solve all problems. Um, less consumption of alcohol will have a bigger effect than communicating uh, within industry players and stakeholders about matters that have been legislated for in law in this act since 2012, rules, regulations, provisions, how to um, manage a place, what's required and so on, uh, conditions of licences, um, less consumption is the way forward. The local alcohol policy should not be viewed as um, a, a punishment on premises or licensees. It is n the nuanced approach to the situation that is present with the consumption of alcohol, the inappropriate and excessive consumption of alcohol. If there is a problem, it needs to be curtailed. The communication is um, a side factor to that. Um, the Strand Management Plan wasn't here in this role when that was in place. Um, don't know the full details of it, but naturally, um, communication both ways is, is a desired situation. Uh, police do still need to um, take care of the enforcement side of things and when there are issues they do need to be called in, in uh, to keep, keep licensees and premises and managers in check. Um, it very much is about licensees taking responsibility for when things do go wrong. This is, alcohol is a regulator, uh, regulated product because it's risky. Nighttime taverns, nightclubs are the riskiest premises of all. The market that they cater for, the, the teenage and adolescent young adult group, is probably the riskiest group available. You combine all those things together with a commercial interest to sell more alcohol, there's some fundamental clashes going on there. Um, so we, we are at different ends, fundamentally. Um, but the communication is, is important, um, but less consumption is the way forward. So, so ha ha having said that, um, we, you, you've focused on the, on the CBD and the, and the operators in the CBD, but actually there's a big part of the problem in downtown Tauranga are people who haven't, as I said, haven't been in those, pla in those bars haven't bought alcohol in those bars or restaurants and are going there with, with already with alcohol and consuming it. Um, and, and it would be interesting to see if um, those incidents were, I mean, we probably haven't got the data, but whether they were with patrons of, you know, what, what is the split between patrons of existing bars and, and those that have come that have been nowhere near those bars? Um, and are just coming downtown because that's the place you go, and you sit in the car park and you and you and you drink, and then Susan has to come and pick up all of, and Mark have to pick up all the bottles in the morning, and and I guess that's the area that that we are we are um, feeling a bit helpless uh, as to how we resolve. So so I'm not sure whether that original accord addressed. That, although I suspect because it was named the Strand, it, it might have included the other side. Um, but I guess that's really the, the, the big issue for us because we can make some rules around the operators in the CBD. We're planning to remove the car park off off the marine uh, off the parade there, but but that probably only moves the, the, the problem somewhere else. That's the, I think that's the real problem that we're trying to so resolve, is how do we restrict the alcohol to those people, which is why we focus then on the off-licence, where they're clearly buying their alcohol. So 
so good morning. Um, firstly, the, the structure that we have down in the CBD of serving alcohol till 3 a.m., in fact, their whole business model is about inviting people in who are preloading. So to bring preloading but have a business model that supports it, um, in my mind, aren't congruous. Uh, secondly, with some of the um, evidence we propose to submit in chambers, you'll see that it is actually uh, unfair to blame the issues down there solely on people coming in and preloading because we'll show you plenty of evidence that people are, are using those bars and causing problems. Uh, and we can't differentiate between the two of them statistically, but we can definitely show you examples of where these are people coming out of the bars. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not denying that that happens, but there is a significant other group that we, we can't, no matter what we do with the bars, we're still not going to be able to control. I guess that's what I'm saying. What, it, what are your views on, on how we do that? Is it, is it environmental? Is it, uh, do you think that um, more restrictions on the off licence will give us some assistance with that? Um, uh, you know, groups who are causing problems? Um, Yes, definitely there's some environmental changes that can be done. The Strand car park going is going to make uh, a difference. It's going to move, if people want to park down there, they're going to have to move into, as I understand it, the Dyer Crescent area. But also the other car park that is directly opposite the Harrington Street bars, my understanding is there's a new development going in there which will pretty make that area obsolete. So the parking up and drinking element is going to be fairly much restricted to car parking, traditional car parking. Um, so I think in part that problem is going to be reduced um, with the changes that are coming. Um, it's pretty hard for us to comment on the off licence aspect influencing that because the, the alcohol could have been purchased three, four, five, ten days before and then just consumed. So it's hard for us to draw inference from uh, on off licence to the impact that it's having on the CBD on the Friday, Saturday night. I think you with your line of questioning, Anne, because it was perhaps what was interesting me as, as well was the off-licence situation. And I'm not certain whether I've picked it up from your submission. Or do you have a view on one of the propositions of moving the off-licence time from 7am to 10am? Um, we tried to stay silent on this aspect because we think the biggest um, gain for reducing alcohol harm in Taronga is impacting those late licences. Um, the impact, the, the the other, the sale of liquor, I mean, for us it's been more focused around those bars, the assaults, the sexual assaults, the fights, um, and we haven't really ventured into that other part because statistically we, we don't have, have a, um, the data which would lead us to a conclusion one way or the other. I think health are, far, health are probably the agency that could address that better than us. Wouldn't you have some data on family harm and, you know, just from about 40% of your work is family harm and you, and my, under, my, my recollection is that alcohol um, consumption plays an enormous part of that. Yes, definitely does. Um, alcohol harm, um, drug, uh, substance abuse, uh, mental health, probably three of the biggest factors that we see in um, family harm and I'm I don't have the data in front of me to go which way or the other, but that's definitely my experience over 30 years in the New Zealand Police. Um, so the sale of alcohol from off licence is going to impact on that. Uh, and it'd be, you know, Taronga coming up to the December, January, we'll probably be looking at 500 plus family and harm callouts per month in the Taronga area alone. It's a huge issue in our community. So anything that can be done to address some of those underlying causes uh, would be greatly appreciated by um, by families. I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but yes, there's some good st stats back in that. Right. Any any other questions for yeah, Shad? Thank you for um, your submission. I was, I was kind of interested in the comments that you made about um, the British Army adjustment in terms of their 
um, ours. And you mentioned um, there was a report, I think, uh, another report done for that. Was it in the, re in the submission that we received? We'll find it. it. It isn't in the pack, but I've re I read it because because I live in Whakatane. I was interested, um, but yeah, yes, it was circulated separately. Yeah, so we'll hunt one out for you. Yeah. Okay. So look. Um, so thank you very much. And so where's my so so what I'll do now is I will. Um, call for a mover and a seconder to go into, thank you Bill and Stephen, to go into public exclusion for the reasons outlined because we're protecting the privacy of, of natural citizens. Um, so all those in favour say aye, against carried, so give us five minutes, we clear the room and, um, and then we can present your video. Thank you. But thank you to the submitters that are here, really appreciate it. Um, and thank you, Mark, for the work that you do every every weekend by the sound of it. <laughs>